Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of our attendees joining us today for this latest Data Science Central webinar. This is Bill Voorhees, your host. I'm the Editorial Director with Data Science Central and also Chief Data Scientist for Data Magnum. I'd like to start off our event today by thanking Tableau uh, for sponsoring today's event. Tableau's a longtime supporter of the Data Science Central community, and we're honored to have them sponsoring our event today. You know, I'd also like to take this opportunity to mention and show our appreciation for some of our other recent sponsors, including Alteryx, Cubal, Dell Statistica, Microsoft, Exaptive, and Pivotal, to name just a few. Now, past webinars are available on demand at datasciencecentral.com, and if you haven't had an opportunity to view them, I encourage you to take a look. They provide some very useful insight into a wide variety of topics of interest to our data science community. Today's webinar is entitled, Exploring Seven Kinds of Data Stories. And before we begin, I'd like to briefly review the format of today's webinar. Today's event will be uh, one hour long. Uh, we have one presenter that I'll introduce in just a minute. There'll be 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A following the presentation, and this event is being recorded and will be available uh, on datasciencecentral.com later this afternoon following today's event. You know, I'd also like to uh, encourage our attendees to provide questions throughout the presentation, and we'll be reviewing and presenting them on your behalf during the Q&A portion of today's event. You know, I'm very pleased to introduce today's speaker, Ben Jones of Tableau. Now, Ben is the Senior Tableau Public Product Manager for Tableau Software in Seattle, and he's the author of Communicating Data with Tableau, which was published by O'Reilly in 2014. Ben leads a team of data analysts that work with journalists and bloggers to share interactive data on the web. And he's also an avid user of Tableau Public himself, publishes Viz's, and tutorials at his website, which is dataremixed.com. Now, Ben holds a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering from UCLA and an MBA from Cal Lutheran. He's co-chair of the Tapestry Data Storytelling Conference and teaches data visualization at the University of Washington. Thanks for being with us today, Ben. We're looking forward to your presentation. You know, what makes a story data-driven? You know, it's no secret that we're all swimming in data journalists in particular, but also business people, analysts, students, and more want to tell stories with data. We know that the human brain is wired to understand data visually, and whether or not you're looking at big data or small data, bringing data visualization into your work adds depth and detail to an article, report, or presentation. So in this session, we'll cover seven types of data stories and how to incorporate them into your work, whether you're a reporter, a student, a business person, or anyone else, you'll learn how to tell stronger, more compelling stories using data. You'll be a better storyteller for it. So Ben, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you. You can begin as soon as you're ready to go. All right, great, thank you very much, Bill. I wanna thank you as well as the Data Science Central Organization for inviting me to speak today. Uh, it is a topic I'm real passionate about. You know, I get to work here in my role uh, with the Tableau Public team with people all around the world who are telling data stories. These are the stories of our time, uh, that whether that's from, um, you know, Ebola or the World Cup or uh, elections, all the major events that are happening all around us. And there's a data angle to many of these stories. And I'm proud and honored to be able to work with them, uh, journalists like Sarah Riley of the New York Daily News or John Schoen of CNBC, who will, will show some of their work today, as well as uh, just data enthusiasts like myself, you know, people who work with data in their day jobs. Uh, and that's more and more of us every day now. Uh, and those individuals are also finding that there's opportunities to use those same skills to speak about and, and uh, champion causes that they are passionate about, whether that's... Um, you know, charities or, or sporting clubs that they're fans of, just so many different topics now. And data is a language, really, so it can be used in many ways. It can also be used to tell these stories, you know, and, and uh, to present narratives to individuals. So my goal today on this presentation, on this talk, is to walk you through what we found to be seven different basic building blocks of data stories. And uh, I think it's helpful to see 
building blocks in that fashion because number one, you know, it helps you to actually find data stories. Um, you can use these seven data story types to drill into your data and analyze it from a number of different points of view. Uh, and then finally, obviously, the second thing it will help with is actually telling those stories to others so that you can engage your audience, present things to them in a way that's compelling, interesting, easy to follow, and ultimately achieves your, your objective. Uh, so that is where we're going to, um, to go today, you know, and I want to make sure that you all get a chance to have some questions as well. So uh, we're going to get to that here uh, in just a moment. But first, I'd like to kind of give you some background as to where this is coming from. Um, so let me just... Uh, so if you, there's, a, there's a book that's come out quite recently that, that I think speaks to this exact uh, use case. So Christopher Booker uh, has written a book called The Seven Basic Plots why we tell stories. And he's defined seven different story types that we see in, in um, TV shows, movies, you know, books we read. Even in our own lives, we can see these stories, arcs play out, uh, whether that's overcoming the monster or rags to riches, the quest, voyage and return, comedy, tragedy, and rebirth. Think about your favorite TV series. Maybe that's Game of Thrones or... If you're like if you're like me, I have to admit Downton Abbey, or you know, even think of maybe something like Superman, or a story that's been told and has had many different aspects or elements to it. You can see these different basic plots in those stories, uh, and you can see you know uh, them time and again, right? These are stories that we're compelled and so interested in. Um, you know, overcoming the monster. Maybe that's Superman fighting Lex Luthor, or Rags to Riches, maybe that's how he went from, you know, an orphan a fleeing a, a destroying planet to, you know, kind of, well, Superman. So, so many different uh, stories that we can see in all of these, these um, in, in our culture, really. I mean, that, that's exactly what we see all around us. You know, Kurt Vonnegut, a favorite author of many of ours, um, came up with a very interesting thesis when he was doing his graduate study work in Chicago. And I want to play a little, it's actually what he felt was his most influential or most um, substantial work, was, was this thesis about story types, which actually he felt was more influential than any, any of the, uh, the stories that he wrote, like Slaughterhouse-Five, these kind of you know, great uh, American novels of the 20th century. So I'm going to play a short video clip for you uh, that I think uh, will help set the stage here for what we're going to do today as it relates to data has created a body of work of startling eccentricity and universal appeal. His singular view of the world applies not just to his stories and characters, but to some of his theories as well. Well, there's no reason why the simple shapes of stories can't be fed into computers. They are beautiful shapes. <coughs> this is the GI axis, good fortune, ill fortune. Sickness and poverty down here, wealth and, and boisterous good health up there. Here's the very middle. Now, this is the B-E axis. B stands for beginning. E stands for electricity. Now, this is an exercise in relativity really is the shape of the curves of what matters and not their origins so we'll start a little above average is why why get a depressing person we'll start <coughs> the whole thing we call this story man in hole but it needn't be about a man and it needn't be about somebody getting into a hole but it's just a good way to remember it somebody gets into trouble gets out of it again people love that story <laughs> they never get sick of it all right, not copyrighted. Another story, also a beautiful curve and easily fed into a computer called Boy Gets Girl, but it needn't be that. Just a way to remember it. Start on an average day, average person, not expecting anything to happen a day like any other. Find something wonderful, just loves it. Oh, God damn it. Got it back again. <laughs> People like that. 
Now, these are beautiful curves, and this gets a little complicated. As computers can now play chess, so I don't know why they can't digest this very difficult curve I'm going to draw for you now. And it so happens that this is the most popular story in our civilization, Western civilization. As we love to hear this story, every time it's retold, somebody makes another million dollars. You're welcome to do it. Now, surprisingly enough, I've said it's depressing. You know, people don't like stories below, about below average days and people. But we're going to start way down here. Worse than that, who is so low? It's a little girl. What's happened? Her mother has died. Her father has remarried a vile-tempered, ugly woman with, with two nasty daughters, big daughters. You've heard it. She, Anyway, there's a party at the palace that night. She can't go. She has to help everybody else get ready. She has to stay home. Now, does she sink lower? No. She's a staunch little girl, and she has had the maximum whack from fate, which is the loss of her mother. She, she can't go any lower than that. Okay, so the fairy godmother comes. Gives her shoes, gives her stocking, gives her <laughs> mascara. Gives her a means of transportation, goes to the party, dances with the prince, has a swell time. Boring, 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 boring. Now there's a slight inclination to that line as I've drawn it because it takes perhaps 20 seconds, 30 seconds for a grandfather clock to strike 12. Does she wind up at the same level? Of course not. She will remember that dance for the rest of her life. Now, she poops along on this level till the prince comes to shoe fits. She achieves off-scale happiness. <laughs> All right, great. Uh, you got to love that, right, Kurt Vonnegut? Um, what, a, what an entertaining speaker. But he comes up with this theory that you can actually trace the, uh, the curve or the arc of stories and that computers can actually go about uh, looking into these stories, right, finding their, their trajectories and comparing them with one another and noticing that there are similar story arcs to each one of them. Um, and so it's kind of a novel theory, but uh, one that that um, has been told, and, and actually nowadays they're actually looking into using some advanced data mining techniques to put this theory of his to even better use. So that's really the genesis of this. You know, so uh, I think when we talk about data stories, it's a particular type of story, right? So he, so Kurt was talking about Cinderella, you know, those different kinds of stories. Those are those are actual stories of of uh, human beings and their lives. So then what do we mean by data story? Let's start by defining what that term means first so that then we can go on and, and uh, study them more. So uh, Jeff here uh, pointed out in a very recent uh, uh, and very influential paper on this topic uh, that though data visualization often evokes comparisons to data storytelling, the relationship between the two is rarely articulated clearly. And so in other words, you know, he makes the point that you know, people are talking about data storytelling and comparing analysis and visualization with storytelling, but what does that actually mean? Like, what's the actual connection there? Um, is it, you know, and I think it means different things to different people. Some people say, well, data storytelling, what does that mean? That could just be a simple tidbit or an insight, some kind of a finding that came out of data analysis. But I think there's another way to understand it that's a little more uh, defined, right, which would be essentially any kind of a narrative that involves quantitative information, right, and presented in visual form. So a quantitative visual narrative. This is where you walk people through a series or a sequence of points made one after another. And there's a variety of ways to do that, as we'll see. But, uh, you know, it's really p showing things to an audience piecemeal, one at a time, and building to a conclusion. And then walking them through a series of, of insights that leaves them at the end with an overall understanding that's deeper than if you would just have shown any one of those points or had created some kind of exploratory environment that would have let them do that themselves. Not that there's anything wrong with those other forms of presenting data and communicating, but data stories in that context are slightly more uh, particular and, and a specific form of communication using data. So that's an important thing to get out of the way is what, what's a data story. Just think of it as any time you want to show someone 
um, you know, it could be two or three or, or 30 uh, different points, one after another, um, from a data set. You're telling a data story. That's what you're doing, right? You're giving them a series of facts, and those facts are being conveyed to them via data visualization. So that's an important thing to define, okay? Now, uh, not too long ago, and back to actually summer of 2014, we released a feature uh, into the world called Story Points. And I was very excited about this feature that we were launching because, you know, we had seen journalists around the world tell stories in sequential fashion using film strips or slideshows, things that allowed their readers to click through one after another of different points, right? Um, think of this kind of like the BuzzFeed model, right? Like one, two, even what I'm doing today, right? Showing you the different story points one after another. And by the way, as an aside, I'm presenting right out of Tableau today. Um, and using it as a presentation platform as well, which it can be used to do. And that will allow us to interact with the data as well as we present, um, which gives it some value over, over uh, simply using PowerPoint. But, uh, but in any case, you know, we were really excited to see what happened when we launched this feature. Now, my team, the Tableau Public team, um, we have themes on our blog where we you know, pick a theme. Like, for example, right now it's Sports Month because we're getting prepared for the Olympics coming up next month in, uh, in uh, Rio de Janeiro. Well, the month after we launched... Story points in the summer of 2014, we said, let's make it storytelling theme. And we also do one other thing uh, besides blogging is we uh, select and curate one visualization every day, and we call that Viz of the Day. And we just look for visualizations that have been published by people who are Tableau public authors putting their work out there, whether it's on social media or on their own sites or potentially on a news organization site as well. And we pick one, and we, and we put it out there, and we, we pick Viz of the Day, and we send a, um, an email out to people who subscribe to that just to see what people are doing. You know, it's a lot of interesting stories that are being told, and that's a way to get exposed to that. But we said to ourselves, let's see if it's possible for us to pick a visualization for every one of the 23 business days of the month of July 2014 that is using this new feature we've put out there called Story Points. You know, we weren't sure we were going to be able to do it. We thought actually probably it wouldn't be possible. Number one, because it's a high bar for Viz of the Day, right? And number two, because it was a brand new feature and we weren't sure people even knew what it was or how to use it. So uh, we were pretty delighted, and this is the, the picture of every one of the winners um, in uh, that month. We were delighted that every single winner w used this brand new feature at the time. And you can see it's everything from rhino poaching in South Africa to the urbanization of China by uh, by Mark Jackson to you know the, the um, a story of Jupiter's moon Callisto. There's visualizations in here about the growth of jobs in the Puget Sound area, which is right here in our own backyard. Um, we've got stories about um, Gazprom, which is a you know a natural gas supplier in Russia to to all of Europe and. Uh, which countries are more dependent on that. Uh, so just a, such a huge variety of data stories. We were blown away. And so uh, we started looking at these and noticing, you know, it seems like there are some commonality, just like what Vonnegut was doing there, that some of these data stories are including some of the same basic building block elements, right? So um, that was something that, that we noticed fairly early on. And so there was an attempt to kind of say, well, wait a minute, you know, can we step back and and see what story type we can find in all of this work. And comparing that also with other kinds of uh, typologies like, you know, presentation types, or um, they even do this with, you know, answering questions on the fly if you're, um, say, like being interviewed or a politician or something and looking at answer types and how you can structure your answer. Well, are there ways to structure these data stories? And we found that there are. And, and here are the seven data story types. Now, we put this out there as a thought starter uh, because we don't, uh, claim or feel that this uh, list of seven data story types is by any means um, comprehensive. And as you go through this with me, I'd love to know if you can think of an eighth. And I think there is one. We'll probably come up with it and maybe even nine and ten and eleven. I mean, there's so many different ways to tell stories. But here are ones that we've come up with that we think are helpful for us, for others, help you understand what are ways you can tell stories that will be noticed and heard and paid attention to. So you can see the seven. One is change over time. Um, there's a drill down. There's a zoom out. Contrast. Intersections. Factors. And outliers. And we're going to look at these seven in sequence here. And to do this, we're going to use a, a fairly simple data set. Now, there's an organization out there called Freedom House. And they put out a report once a year 
called the Freedom of the Press. And, and what they do is they go around and you know uh, they score uh, countries on um, how free journalists are in those countries, right? And so journalists can come up against a variety of pressures uh, in the environments in which they work, whether that's political or legal or economic. And so if you were to look at each country year by year by year and ask yourself, you know, is there a journalist, how, how relatively free is a journalist to tell um, the stories of, of, uh, of their time and how free are they to operate like that, then you could uh, understand what Freedom House is trying to accomplish here. Now, one thing to think to know about the scores is that it's sort of like golf, right? The lower the score, the better. So, uh, you know, in that sense, it could be seen, uh, seen as like a pressure score, like temperature, right? How, how hot is the temperature in the room for someone who's trying to uh, conduct themselves in this profession? So high scores are bad. Um, now, what you can see just looking at this data set is it's pretty simple, right? There's only nine columns. Um, we've, we're talking about just shy of a couple hundred countries and data going back to 2001, 2002. Um, and you can see that each country gets scored along three different factors, legal, political, and economic, and that those three scores add up to the overall freedom uh, of the press score. Okay, And then, then that score then informs a rating, and you're either falling into one of three buckets. You're not free as a country, you're partly free, or you're classified as free. And that can change over time, depending on how the uh, climate and the environment changes there. Okay, so that's a data set. Now you can say, well, you know, wow, you probably work with data that's a whole lot more complex than this. So maybe you'd be thinking to yourself, you know, is it really possible to find seven different data stories out of a, you know, nine column spreadsheet? Um, and that's something that we'll look at today. We'll see if it's possible that there are actually seven different data stories that tell you something different about this data set or not. All right, let's start, let's start with the first one. Let's just dive right into it. So the first one is, I think, one of the most fundamental uh, data stories, and that's change over time. Now, change over time, in some way, shape, or form, is going to be found in just about any of these data stories that we're going to uh, see. Now, uh, in that sense, they're not mutually exclusive. And we'll also find that, just like Legos, building blocks can be combined. And so, you know, we'll see some examples, and we'll talk a little bit about how these data stories can be put together into um, you know, more complex data stories that include various types. So change over time is a fundamental element because as we're looking at the world around us, you know, this becomes a basic question that almost underlies everything you can think of, which is how are things changing? You know, how was it before? How is it now? And how is the world going to be like in the future? Those are fundamental questions for anyone running a business, anyone trying to understand, you know, um, pretty much anything, whether that's the political climate, whether that's the... The, um, the fortunes um, or lack thereof of a particular sports team, you know, whether that's, uh, you know, um, you know your, your, own, your own history and, and maybe looking at your own Fitbit data, you know. I mean, these questions related to time are basic and fundamental and ubiquitous. And so this is, in, in that sense, I would say this is probably the most important of the uh, seven data story types. So can we find uh, a data story with freedom of the press data that involves change over time? We, we can. So uh, if we begin, for example, back in 2001 and count up all the countries that are free, partly free, and not free, we'll notice that you know, there were 75 countries at the turn of the century that were classified as free. And then there were um, you know, um, uh, you know, fewer that were uh, partly free and not free. Okay, so in 2001, we started off with 75 countries that classified as free. But if we zoom ahead, we noticed to, to kind of the most recent data here that I had available at the time of creation of this workbook, we noticed that by 2013, the number had fallen to 63. So from 75 countries down to 63 countries by uh, 2013, which is a little over a decade later. Okay, so that's looking at change over time. And if we just look at the number of countries that are classified as free, we can see that, you know, that, that's a declining trend uh, that's concerning. Right? So change over time is, is a very, very important thing to look at here. And now you would immediately learn from this data story that I just told you. And it was admittedly a short snippet of a story. But uh, the key takeaway is, well, you know, what's happening? Why is the freedom of the press, um, why are there fewer countries that are classified as free uh, more recently than there were back in the uh, turn, of the, of the cent turn of the millennium? 
what's happening, right? So, and in that sense also, I would put this out there too, is that, you know, a lot of times the function of a data story is to raise more questions because it can show you something that's true, all right? So it gives you a, an idea of, of reality and of facts, but oftentimes that just leads to another more interesting, uh, more fundamental question, you know, and oftentimes that involves the word why. And data doesn't always answer the question why, and that's okay. And that's why a lot of times these presentations we give you know, have to break out of data and, and look into other types of, of information that we can convey, right? Anecdotes, interviews, quotes, observations, um, those things can be, um, you know, augmenting and complementing the data story. And then in that sense, it becomes a multi multifaceted story. So in this case, you know, we learn something about freedom of the press, right? So fewer free countries now than there were in the past. Why is that? That's a great question, and I don't know the answer to that. But the report goes into those details if you look at the Freedom House website, what's happening, right? So we'll also look at another data story a little later on that maybe breaks that down uh, somewhat for us. But change over time is basic, right? So we're going to use the Freedom House Freedom of the Press data as our touchstone. We're going to keep coming back to it, and we're going to explore each of the seven data stories from the point of view of that one simple data set. But in between them, I also want to take excursions at and look at other data sets to help uh, drive home the story type further and explain it in more detail and, and more information. So for example, I'll show you another example here um, from CNBC, and this is showing also change over time, right? So here's another example of the same primary and, and critically important data story type that John Schoen, who's an economics reporter uh, out of New Jersey for CNBC, created. And again, the first couple months of, uh, of this feature being out. But um, what he's doing is he's showing the is a stacked area chart, okay? And it's showing the cumulative value of all of the 30 countries in the Dow 30 industri industrial index, right? So, the, so you take those 30 countries that are part of the, uh, the Dow 30, and you add up, um, in this case, you're adding up their, their total market capitalization um, on every single day, in this case, from 2010, forward until until uh, the future, right? So this is actually going to just, I believe, 2015 when he created the workbook. And so what's interesting, right, is that you can see the history of the country as told through this stacked area chart. So we can, for example, look at what happened um, in the 2000s where we had the Great Recession, right? So we had these different um, kind of major uh, upsetting events that occurred, and you can see how that played out in the Dow 30. Or this is a, a very fascinating one. You can look at the tech boom in the late 90s. Here's the, the dot-com bubble, you know, resulting in this massive spike, right? So this is sort of in some ways the economic history of, our, uh, of the country, of the United States, shown um, through this data story, right? And so even if you were to go all the way back, you can look at the Great Depression um, or the crash that led up to it, right, and, and how that um, played out over time, right? So again a data story that's told, that's told, that's showing change over time. In this case, it's just like a, you know, a decade by decade history. So fascinating work done by John Schoen here. And again, making use of this story over time, um, critically important data story type. You'll see it, and like I mentioned, you know, you will see change over time in many, many data stories. And we'll see that as well here too as we go through. Okay, so that's our first data story that we show as an example here, this uh, CNBC example. All right. Story number two, this is something that's very common that we're going to want to do, which is to drill down. You know, and you use this term a lot probably. Uh, and the second, the third story point, which we'll discuss in a moment, zoom out, is sort of I would call like a, the sister story type. They're very related, closely related and paired in, in one way. Uh, you'll see that they're just the same story told in opposite directions. But uh, drill down, let's take a look at a drill down example. F back to the freedom of the press data. Okay, so what we're looking at here now is the world map, okay? So same color scheme as before. Blue means free, red means not free, and gray means partly free. So if we take a look at the whole world, we can see that it's roughly divided into thirds. We've got, a, you know, um, we've got about 36% uh, that are classified as free, and 30 is partly free, and then 33% is not free, okay? So this, and this is showing each one of these countries and their score. Again, remember, high scores are bad. Um, low scores are good. And so if we look at the entire country, we can see that whole spread, right? At the, uh, at the aggregate level, all the way at the highest possible level. But then if we drill down into Asia a little bit, we'll notice that um, it's a little different, right? In fact, almost two-thirds, more than half of the, um, of the region of, of Asia is classified as not free right now, right? So you can see all of these red dots all the way across the region here. 
right? And then if we drill down further, um, of all of the countries in Asia, uh, North Korea is a country with the, uh, the highest or poorest rating here with a score of 97 out of 100, uh, where journalists there obviously are under intense pressures. Um, so again, this is kind of starting from the high-level view and sequentially moving down through the different levels and phases into uh, a more nuanced view. Now, this is really common. Think about your company that you work for, right? There's business units and departments and groups and teams and then individual contributors, right? So this kind of ability to drill down into an organization is possible. Also think about it in terms of products. You've got you know, product uh, categories and then um, families and then individual products. And so again, hierarchies of these product breakdowns or even maybe going to the world of sports. Think about it in terms of you know, there's a sport, say there's basketball, and then within basketball there's leagues like the NBA. Then maybe you have the Eastern and Western Conference, you know, so it breaks down even further. And then even within those you know, major divisions, there's smaller conferences like the West or the Southwest or various regions there. So regionally, again, similar to what we've seen here geographically, those sports teams can break down um, into smaller and smaller groups. So drilling down is a really, really common, popular, and powerful data story that you can tell. And we've shown how we can do this with the, uh, with the freedom of the press data, right, by really zooming in on a totally different story than what we told before, which is, you know, the situation in North Korea, in Asia in general, and then North Korea in particular, and how that compares with the overall situation worldwide. So it gives you this comparison, right? It helps you see how different component parts compare with the whole and compare with um, individual component parts within those subparts. So a really powerful data story because people see, you know, especially, you know, drilling down, you, you know, you love that story because you kind of see the big picture. You start with the big picture and you see kind of what, the overall situation is, and then you're able to get into the nitty-gritty. And so drilling down is really, really powerful. Now, the third story type is, like I said, the same story just told in the opposite direction. A lot of times we want to zoom out where we start from the particular and we move to the general. And sometimes those can be told back-to-back, -to -back, right, because maybe you zoom it, drill down and then zoom out in a slightly different way. So again, same Let's just kind of just take that exact same story. We'll look at a different region and we'll, we'll go the other direction. So maybe we can start here and say that uh, you know, of all of the countries in the world in uh, in the most most current year, actually, let's move ahead here to 2013. There we go. Um, Sweden, Norway, uh, and the Netherlands are the most free, so they have the lowest score, and they have this, actually they have a score of 10, and you can see them right there, right here in in the, this region. And then you can see, well, how does that compare to the overall, right? So overall. Um, more than two in th out of three European countries are categorized as free. In fact, it's 68.9%, right? We can see that there are some not free as well. But we can compare Sweden, Norway, and, uh, and the Netherlands with all of the regions, with the entire region of Europe. And then, you know, again, zooming out further, we can see the situation globally, just like we did when we told the other story involving North Korea uh, in story type number two, right? So this one is just involving kind of starting from this, you know, um, point of view of, of the single element and then moving out to the point of view of the collective. Um, you know, this oftentimes can involve a, like a literal story of a human being, right? So maybe you have, um, and that can be very, very powerful because we know that, you know, stories of human lives are very powerful to people. So for example, you could start with, you know, your entire customer base and survey results there of those customers, right? Uh, and you could drill down into tell the story of one individual person and maybe even have a, a conversation or present that person's thoughts or point of view or their individual experience, right? And how that compares to the overall collective. In this case, with the zoom out story, you would maybe start with that individual person's story and then zoom out to show how that compares with you know, the, the broad spectrum of a lot of um, uh, different experiences there at the aggregate or the statistics uh, level. So combining data stories with individual human, real human stories and putting those together is a very powerful way to present data. Okay, so drill down, zoom out. You know, those are, those are kind of, um, you know, <laughs> Tweedledee and Tweedledum, right? Those are, those are uh, sister story types that are very closely related. Let's move on to look at number four, which is contrast. Now, contrasts are very, very powerful stories as well because, you know, we love the, um, we love contrasts. So we love the, the David and Goliath, 
you know, kinds of stories where you're pitting two opposite things against each other or comparing very, very different things side by side, right? Maybe that's the extreme values in a data set. Maybe that's, um, you know, looking at things from a point of view of min versus max. Um, and so let's look at an example of how we could do that with this freedom of the press data. So let's say, for example, well, which are the countries in the most recent year of, that we have data here that have uh, the best ratings, the 10 best rating rated countries? And here they are. You can see them. Now, what you can also see is that, you know, they, they're very closely aligned on the north-south. They almost, you know, lie in a very similar um, a line of longitude here, right? So that's very interesting. And you notice they're all in the very same region right here in Europe, right? Every single one of them, all the 10 countries with the best scores are in Europe. So that's an interesting thing to look at. Now, well, on the other hand, right, and here's where the contrast comes in. If we said, where are the countries with the worst scores, the countries that have the highest you know, pressure scores? Well, we can see that actually they occur on five different continents. So it's much more broadly spread. This is, you know, number... Um, I think it's like 188 through 197. So those are countries with the 10 worst ratings in 2013 when the data was collected here. But again, look at the spread east to west. You've got Cuba over here in the Americas, and you've got North Korea and Asia. You've got a few countries you know, in Europe as well as down in Africa, in Asia as well, in Middle East. So you've got broad representation. right? So in other words, there are many, many uh, places around the world, you know, and those places are very, very different culturally geographically, where journalists face intense pressures. And so that's an interesting uh, contrast between, as we saw before, you know, where the countries are located that have the best scores. So contrasts are so, so powerful. Think of Rocky. You know, you've got uh, the boxer um, who's just lifting you know, sleds and running in the snow, and you've got the other boxer who's juiced and you know, on the treadmills and you know, using all the latest technology, right? So that's kind of almost sort of a, a version or a story of the man versus machine story. We love these different contrasts. You know, we love talking about them in sports. We love talking about them in politics, contrasting political parties. You know, these kinds of differences that underlie the, the, um, the basic components of the world we live in uh, and the businesses we're in and run um, are very useful for telling powerful data stories. So contrasting um, a really powerful data story. Okay, so let's look at an example of that. So um, a couple of years ago, this is actually the very first uh, use of story points, quote, like in the wild, as we call it, right? So Inga Ting, who's a data journalist at the Sydney Morning Herald in Sydney, Australia, published this less than 24 hours after we le released the feature. And uh, we were pretty, pretty impressed that, that someone had got it and created something that was so useful right away. Now, what this is doing is, is this is a fundamental question even prior to it becoming such a global issue lately. But Australia back uh, in 2014 was looking very closely at this issue of um, sheltering refugees and how were they doing. How was, so she was trying to give her readers of the Sydney Morning Herald a perspective of how she, how, the, how Australia, rather, was, was doing compared to other countries. So there's a lot of refugees in Australia. How does that compare with refugees and the number of refugees in other countries? So the first thing she did is she said, well, let me just look at it from the sheer number of refugees. So there's, for example, in Australia here, you know, uh, 34,000 refugees that they're hosting. Um, and uh, that ranks 48th in the world. And that compares with uh, Pakistan, Iran, Jordan, Lebanon, Turkey, these are countries here in gray which are classified in o the OECD or the UNHCR um, classification as low income and then the blue ones out here are high income and the orange one is there is Australia. So they rank 48th in terms of the overall number of refugees hosted, but that's not quite apples to apples, right? So she said, well, let's see if we compare that to as a share of the population. So what's the ratio of refugees to the overall population? And she noted that, well, you know, we drop, you know, Australia drops from 48th to 62nd. If you use that, if you contrasting way of comparing uh, refugee hosting with uh, other countries. And then if you compare it to GDP or economic wealth, you can see that it falls even further to 74th. So what she's doing is she's giving her readers a series of, of ranks, uh, rankings, right? How does Australia rank? And she's contrasting their rank from a variety of different uh, ways of, of ranking, right? One is just the overall and then a percent of population and then a uh, ratio to GDP. And so that contrast um, shows the readers, you know, that they're not doing as well as they are 
uh, as a as a function of their wealth um, than they are, for example, potentially just in the sheer number of people that are housed within their borders. An interesting contrast in, in a data story that you know tells a powerful message. Maybe they could do more uh, as as a, a country, and and I'm sure that that could. Uh, in fact, if you look at a lot of these uh, high income countries here in blue, you can see that many of them um, are quite far down on the list here. So. Uh, so that's an interesting point of view that she's putting out there, right? Whether you agree with it or not, she's making that point, and she's making a data-driven point, and she's telling it in a story, one point after another. And this is one that, I, again, I feel falls into the contrast category because she's contrasting the different methods of ranking. Okay, three more to go. So intersections. Um, this is a story that we love to hear because it relates to when things cross over, right? So when does one um, element surpass another? And so we see this a lot, for example, in politics, like in polling. When did one candidate uh, cross over another candidate in the polls? Or even if you think about the flow of a, of a sporting event, like a basketball game, you, you're looking at cumulative points. At what point did Team B you know, blow by Team A and uh, become, you know, or sort of uh, take the upper hand. I think this is probably why people love, you know, NASCAR, right? Which I struggle to understand. I mean, sometimes it can be fun to watch, but what do you, if you just watch the clips on ESPN, what do you see? You typically see the points where, where a car gets passed, right? Also the crashes, also the finish line, but the one element that is sort of the most exciting uh, for the race fan is the, the point at which uh, a driver passes another, right? So intersections become really, really powerful data stories. Okay, let's look at an example here in the freedom of the press data. Again, back to the same color scheme. Blue is free, red is not free, gray is partly free. So if we go back to 2001, we can see that m the most common uh, categorization was free, 75 countries. We saw that in the first story type, right? And again, this one, as you'll see, is closely related to change over time, but it's almost a subset of change over time where a specific thing occurs in that change over time. So it goes blue, red, gray from top to bottom. Blue is the most common, you know, free. Red, not free, is the next most common. Gray, partly free, is the least common of the different categorizations of countries in the freedom of the press data set. Okay. If we zoom ahead, though, we'll notice that in 2009, partly free crosses over not free, and you get a crisscrossing of these lines. This is an intersection. And we want to know what happened there. Why is it that as of 2009, you know, the number of countries classified as not free has actually become fewer than the ones as partly free. And so far, it looks like we have a positive development on our hands here, doesn't it? This first intersection seems to be a good thing. But if we play it forward even just a couple of years more, we'll notice that this classification of partly free actually crosses over the classification of free, the count of countries that are classified as free, and goes from the least common categorization to the most common categorization. So it crosses over both of the other lines, one after another. And then actually, interestingly enough, if we go all the way ahead to the end, we'll see that the, the order flips. Now we've got you know, the most common uh, type of categorization of these countries is partly free, whereas at the beginning it was the least common. And uh, you know, again, the, the free countries, which used to be the most common categorization, now becomes the least common, or the ones with the smallest, the fewest number of countries in it. And so we have a complete reversal of these categories in order. Um, and another crossover occurred you know, when the number of not free countries crossed over the number of free countries. So these are intersections, and they're fascinating. right? And again, they beg the question, why? W what's going on? Why did one uh, country, uh, where did, why did the, the, the sum of all of the countries with a certain classification go from uh, lower to higher or vice versa? So intersections, you can think about this in your business, right? When maybe, um, you know, the, uh, the revenue uh, of, of, a pro of a product line crosses over the costs to put it out there. That's an important uh, juncture, right, in time where you go from not profitable to profitable, a key point in time. You want to know when that happens. How long does it take to get there? What are the factors that lead up to that that cause us to go from unprofitable to profitable, right? That's a fundamental question. And again, a subset of the change over time data story where things are crossing over one another. But the, you know, as I mentioned, it begs the question, why? And that's where the sixth data story type can come in really handy. Because 
it, oftentimes the phenomena that we're looking at has uh, multiple factors that um, that go into it, right? So it's we're looking at maybe a higher level effect or uh, metric, but that metric may be broken down into a number of different sub-metrics that combine in a variety of ways. Maybe they're simply additive. Maybe they're multiplicative. Maybe there's some uh, more complex equation that combines these different elemental factors into your higher level view. And let's look at an example and, and just right out of this same thing with here with the freedom score data set, right? So if we take a look at the average score, on average, the freedom of the press is gradually getting worse, right? So the average score in 2001 was 45.3. And the average score in 2013, you can see it creeping up and up and up, and now it's 47.8, right? Again, high scores are bad. So the score, the overall average score, is getting slightly worse, right? So that's interesting. Um, but we know also, if you remember from when we looked at the data set at the beginning, that there's three factors or three um, you know, sub-elements that add up together to give us the overall score. And so we can take a look at, you know, for example, blue, these are these turquoise legal uh, pressures, right? The score there for legal goes from 13.9 up to 14.3, right? Economic pressures and political pressures. We can see the change of these different factors over time. Now, a stacked area chart is kind of hard, a difficult way to show this data because it becomes tough to see which one's going up or down since they're stacking like this. But so instead, if we break them out and show them as lines, you can see that, you know, number one, the political scores are actually higher. Um, and that's simply because they actually come out of a, um, a larger, larger number, right? Um, there's a higher number of total points that could go towards the political pressures. But also you'll notice that the, uh, the, the slopes of these lines for legal and economic is fairly horizontal, fairly flat, right? But that, you know, that, that rise, that overall average, and these are, again, this is average, all the average uh, scores, it seems to be due to the political pressures going up slightly from year to year to year. And that's what's causing um, the overall freedom of the press scores to gradually get worse. So, again, you know, this gives us a new, this kind of peels back the onion and gives us a new appreciation, right? So if we say, well, why is the freedom of the press around the world getting worse? We'd say, well, we need to study the political climate in these different countries. And why are political pressures rising uh, for, for journalists? And what are some examples of that? You know, again, then we can drill down. Well, what about, you know, certain countries? What's happening in the political climate there? Right? So factors can be combined with drill down to give you even a more a nuanced data story there and to go from one answer and question to yet another, right? So factors, we see this a lot, you know, again, as I mentioned, you know, think about, um, well, and, and it combines with the hierarchical view as well. So maybe you've got, you know, the overall revenue for a company and how is that broken down by the different product families or categories that that organization, um, you know, markets and sells. Um, you can take a look at, you know, a baseball team and the number of home runs and who's hitting the most and the least, right? So those are ways to break down the higher level hierarchical view with the more nuanced individual component level view and factors. Breaking things down like that for people is something they really appreciate because it's not always easy to know what, uh, it's important to know what's happening at the aggregate or at the highest level. That's really what matters the most. But then oftentimes what needs to be addressed or fixed happens at a much more um, elemental level. And so being able to walk someone through those factors can be very important. Here's an example of factors and how they break together. This is a, I would call like, you know, production, production quality, highly designed um, version of story points. This was created by Matt Francis uh, out of the UK. And he was taking a look at um, sunspots and um, cosmic rays, solar irradiation, and global temperatures. So uh, very, um, obviously very relevant story right now as we seek to understand um, the various uh, mechanisms behind the rise in, in average temperature on the planet we're living on. But you can see that one uh, element of that, you know, probably among others, is that um, there are um, sunspots tend to, and this is going back to the 1800s here, or actually the 1901, uh, you can see that the um, surface of the sun um, and the, the, the number of sunspots that appear on the surface of the sun seems to, to uh, follow a cyclical pattern. And so does the, um, the number of cosmic rays. And this is looking at a slightly shorter timeline here from the 50s, right? And the amount of solar irradiation that hits the Earth. 
and we can see this also having the same kind of a cycle, right? So again, comparing the cyclical patterns. And we can see even a cyclical pattern here in the global temperatures. So we can see that there are cycles in global temperatures, and we can also see that there's an overall rising trend, which may be d due to something else, right? Again, that's a very important question for us, but we do see some of these patterns. And then he lets us, you know, kind of layer those one over another, right? So we can see the sunspots and how that compares with irradiance or how it compares with, for example, cosmic rays, which seems to be out of sync or the global temperatures, right? So we can see some of these peaks and valleys coinciding, all right? So factors, what's causing something? Or what are the different correlate, correlation factors that we can find? Okay, this last one here is uh, one, of my, uh, one of my favorites, outliers. Outliers are great because, you know, we want to see the exceptional. We want to see the thing that, is, that sticks out like a sore thumb, and that's why the scatter plot is representative. And I want to get to Q&A here, too, so let's move quickly through this. So if we take a look, this is a box and whisker plot, right? So if we take a look at all of the countries globally, we don't see any outliers overall, right? So everything's within the whiskers here. You know, we've got a, obviously a wide range of scores, and we saw that already from the best countries, Netherlands, Norway, and, and, uh, and, um, and Sweden, and then the worst countries up here, um, North Korea, and so forth. But if we break them out into their regions, and create a different box plot for each of our regions, we can see that actually there are some outliers here, aren't there? So, for example, the Belarus and Russia have uh, poorer scores than the other countries in Europe. They're outliers. As does Fiji and Oceania, even though it's partly free, it seems to be um, you know, an outlier in that region as a country that has a score that's particularly um, worse than the other ones in the same region. And on the other side of the fence, you can take a look, for example, at um, a region like the Middle East, where Israel has a substantially different score than other countries within that region as well. Okay, so outliers, they still, again, beg the question, why? What's happening? Why is that data point so different? And oftentimes we need to look at other data or get out of spreadsheet land and go talk to people, right? That's also very important. But this story type is really important because it helps us see the things that are exceptional. It also helps us define the errors in the data, right? So a lot of times you'll see an outlier and there's something wrong with it. So we need to be very careful about how we treat outliers and what conclusions we draw from them. We also need to be careful about when we feel it's appropriate to filter them out um, because oftentimes they give you important information about a variety of different things in the data collection process as well as in the underlying f fundamental um, reality that, that data is reflecting, okay? So let's review real quick. We talked about seven data story types. Right? Change over time, drill down, zoom out, contrast, intersections, factors, and outliers. There's probably more. I think there's many, many more. In fact, I'd like to know what you all think, and, and uh, f please feel free to um, tweet them out to me as well as any other thoughts and comments you have on this presentation, and use the hashtag 7 data stories as well as um, Data Science Central to just get a conversation going if you're interested. But um, you can also find me on Twitter at, at Data Remixed and, and engage with me there. I'd love to know what you think about it. But uh, for now, let's wrap it up there. I do th want to thank you for your time, and I hope that this was helpful and beneficial. You know, Again, just think about these seven data story types as things you can use to ask yourself if you're looking at all the data, uh, at all the different stories that are, that are in a data set. And hopefully this also, one of the important things I hope you walk away from with this presentation is the, the sort of a, a humbling realization that once you think you've got a data set well understood, because remember, this is a pretty simple data set. It was nine columns, you know, a couple hundred rows, tiny compared to the things that you're looking at in your, in your job. So next time you think you've got it figured out and you know a data set from beginning to end and end to end, just realize that there are so many different data stories here. That's why it's so important for this to be a team sport, for us to consider multiple people's perspectives, because they're going to approach it a little differently, think about it a little differently, analyze it from a different point of view. And we'll all come up with a better understanding if we, if we go about it that way. Um, and just be open to the fact that there's more stories to find and even the simplest of data sets you're going to come across. Okay, so with that, I am going to turn it back over to uh, the moderators here. And I'd like to see if you have any questions. I'd love to chat a little bit about it. Um, so with that, can I uh, turn it back over? Hey, Ben, thank you so much for that uh, excellent presentation. Uh, that uh, was quite a powerful structure you presented, and uh, I certainly learned a lot. Uh, we'll get started with today's Q&A session. 
And I want to thank the audience for their participation. Uh, we've had a lot of questions that have come in during the presentation. So we'll do our best to get through all of them in the time remaining. And uh, during this Q&A session, I'll leave up this screen with contact information for Ben if you'd like to contact him following uh, today's uh, seminar. So uh, Ben, you know, coming all the way back up to the top of the topic, uh, we hear a lot about data storytelling. But what, in short, is the difference between data storytelling and good old-fashioned data analysis? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, uh, data analysis involves finding data stories oftentimes. Oftentimes it just involves uh, what I would call um, exploring the contours of your data where you're just seeing what is in there, right? But as you go through the data analysis and, and anal advanced analytics processes, you're going to come up with some tidbits and, and sometimes those need to be presented in data stories. So the difference is just... Um, a data story is this sequential narrative, and so oftentimes it's the output or the outcome of data analysis. Um, understanding that data is presented in that way oftentimes lets you um, lets you kind of look at it in that in that in that kind of a way. Okay, well, hey Ben, thank you, and you know uh, you're so fortunate to be able to spend uh, so much concentrated effort on building data visualizations. The rest of us, however, only get to do this once in a while. Uh, and we're always looking for inspiration. So uh, a number of folks in the audience have asked, you know, if if uh, the charts that you've shown or the uh, very beautiful charts that you showed uh, from outside sources uh, are available as a library or as templates or in some other format from which we can gather inspiration on the Tableau site or perhaps on, on your other site. Yes, that's a great question. So um, one way in is that you can, I think I can put a link right in here, right, Bill? Can I do that? Right in the chat, I can say chatting with all and put a link in there? I, I don't believe the audience will be able to see that, but you can tell them ah, that. Okay. Sure. So if you actually just Google data remixed seven story types or seven data story types and data remixed all one word, you'll see this entire presentation on my website. And that has, um, you know, the structure, all seven elements, as well as the interactive workbooks themselves. Um, another thing I would refer you to, another place I would refer you to, is on the Tableau Public site. So if you go to public.tableau.com, so that's public.tableau, T-A-B-L-E-A-U, and you go to Viz of the Day in the gallery at the top. So click on Gallery at the top and then in Viz of the Day. So public.tableau.com, click on Gallery, find the Viz of the Day gallery. You're going to find one of these interesting data stories every single day, and you can sign up to subscribe to it so you know, it gets an inbox, and you can choose which of the ones are interesting headlines or uh, screenshots that come in your inbox that you can then go investigate that data story. So that's, I find it's a great way just to keep a steady stream of, of other people's work um, in front of me because I find that you know, people do some pretty amazing things, and I can learn a lot from it. So yeah, definitely go to that website there to uh, find the link to the presentation I just gave. And definitely do go see about following Viz of the Day so that you can uh, f find out when these things are happening in real time instead of uh, having a repository. It's just a fresh, you know, constant flow of, of data stories. Terrific. Yeah, it, it is the inspiration that we need as much as anything. And I certainly learned a lot today. For example, it would not probably have occurred to me to use Tableau in lieu of PowerPoint, but now that I've seen you do that, that's something I'm going to consider. Uh, within these, this new story this uh, story point feature um, and I think you said that was about to be introduced or is it already introduced does that guide you to select one of these seven story types and then lead you through a structure or are those uh, just suggestions the story type the story points feature which is already available and uh, you can actually uh, play around with it if you download tableau public it's um, it's not a trial it's not freemium where it's just the free version of the product. The limitation with Tableau Public is anything you save is in the public domain. So you want to use data about things that you wouldn't have any problem putting out there. Um, and there's a lot of data that nowadays let, that fits into that category. But um, So the story points feature you can play around with on your own using Tableau Public for free. Also, um, you know, it doesn't itself kind of, you know, include the structure within the code of the product. So this is more just um, kind of really came as a result of us putting that feature out there and realizing that there are these different types that we see people using, but we didn't bake it back into the product. So it's really up to you to kind of find your own data story and tell it and maybe find an eighth or ninth story point. So 
um, in that sense, you know, it's it's a framework that you can use outside of the the features of the product itself, which is much more um, kind of hands off and, and allows you to kind of you know create the data story that you want to create, as opposed to you know sort of making suggestions in that way. Um, it's a little more free form, but um, but yeah, I found it helpful just kind of that little one slider of the different shapes and icons. You know, I just kind of print it out really and just kind of like you know t you know glance at it from time to time to see, hey, am I looking at all the data stories here, right? Is there something else I can be looking at? But that's up to you, and I'd love to know, again, if you if you think there's other things you could include in there that I could add to it. But, uh, yeah, good question. I don't know if there's an opportunity to bake it back into the product or not. It might be an interesting conversation to have. Uh, but, yeah, that feature is definitely available and, you know, totally free to, to download and play around with and use. Well, Ben, thanks for some great answers to some very good questions. And for those of you that asked questions that uh, weren't answered today, we'll be sending all those unanswered questions to Ben and the Tableau team so they can follow up with you after today's webinar. Um, I have just a few quick announcements. If you'll please mark your calendar uh, for July 14th, that's right, just two days from now, uh, that's our next DSC webinar, which is four steps to improve search relevance, business outcomes, and user experience, and that's going to be sponsored by Alteryx. Also, uh, today's taping will be available for on-demand viewing later today uh, and can be found on the homepage of datasciencecentral.com in the webinar tab that's located at the top of the page. Well, this brings today's webinar to a close, and I'd like to thank our audience for their attendance and thoughtful questions, and a special thanks again to Tableau for their sponsorship and our speaker today, Ben Jones, for his insight into today's topic. Now, my name is Bill Voorhees. I'm very pleased to have been your host for today's event. I look forward to seeing you all again on July 14th. Have a great day.